really what I'd like to do, if you could bear with me, is start by looking at the history of French nutrition, some of the definitions, and then go into the training process of home parental nutrition, especially the choice of a catheter uh, central line, um, and then go into three of the most common complications that we experience with central catheters. Uh, here's my um, research grants, and again, I don't have any pertinent uh, disclosures for uh, this talk. So let's really start by defining uh, home parental nutrition and more notably intestinal failure. Uh, when we talk about patients who need uh, parental nutrition at home, we often say, you know, it's because they have intestinal failure, which is essentially a reduction in GI function below the minimum necessary for the absorption of nutrients, um, water, and or electrolytes, so, such that we need intravenous either water, electrolytes, or all of the above, including nutrients as well for health and, and growth. We can then classify this based on onset, meaning how long we think this need will be. Will it just be short term? You know, will it be kind of prolonged acute condition which is lasting weeks to months, or is it something that's going to last months or years, or maybe be something that's permanent? You know, we often look at, well, what's the need based on, you know, why individuals have intestinal failure. Uh, so some may have short bowel, uh, right, where the bowel is, is too short to be able to absorb enough fluids, electrolytes, and nutrients. Um, in many of those cases, it, it could be lifelong uh, intestinal failure. Other patients may need parental nutrition at home due to uh, intestinal fistula, like an entrocutaneous fistula. You know, this may be more limited in that we need to provide nutrition until the bowel can sort of heal and, and maintain uh, weight, and then the surgeons could take the patient back uh, for surgery and take down that fistula. So, again, it's important to look at how long the need will be, but also uh, why. Um, you know, they have intestinal failure. Um, one other thing that we often look at also about intestinal failure is um, how much uh, calories and volume uh, patients need as well. This can also be important uh, to help us um, in terms of improvement bowel adaptation because, again, we only want to provide parental nutrition uh, for as long as the patient needs, and if they're able to meet their nutritional needs to oral intake, you know, we would love to wean off and, and remove the catheter. Um, so, again, bear with me with this, but I'm always fascinated by the history and where we have come, especially when it comes to catheter. Um, and really, you've all seen this slide probably a, a thousand times. Uh, really pivotal work um, showing uh, for the first time in the 60s. Um, you know, that we could uh, provide nutrition, IV hydration, micronutrients um, through uh, parental uh, nutrition and have, in this case, um, beagle puppies uh, grow very similar to their counterparts who receive uh, oral nutrition, right? Soon afterwards, reports of use of this, in, in this case, an infant who weighed uh, five pounds at birth, but was really born with atresia of the small bowel, and so had no means of being able to meet nutritional needs uh, through oral intake, uh, was given uh, parental uh, nutrition, and again was, was done so um, with this catheter you could see through the external jugular. Um, that is, is there, and you can see that there and how big that catheter uh, was at the time. Um, you know, uh, the baby did well on parental nutrition. One of the big issues that they were facing at the time uh, was that they also uh, did not have availability of lipids. Intralipid yet wasn't um, 
quite as readily available in the U.S. Um, and so they actually um, used safflower oil and other oils, um, but still uh, was developing uh, essential fatty acid uh, deficiency. And so they used uh, fresh plasma from the parents after a fatty meal uh, to kind of provide those essential fatty acids. So just fascinating work. Uh, but one of the biggest things was in, in that infant situation was that at that time, the technique for doing this at home hadn't readily been developed. And so um, with that, they faced a very difficult situation and eventually withdrew uh, parental nutrition. Uh, and it was a, a bit later that you started to see, you know, this concept of home parental nutrition start to develop. And a lot of the work was done by different folks. Uh, the one I've highlighted here is Dr. Skibner, Scribner, who was a nephrologist and used some of the same techniques that were being used in dialysis patients. So utilize this AV shunt. Um, you could see that there um, with this permanent se segment of silicone and rubber tubing to be able to uh, allow the patient to receive nighttime feeds, infusion in this case of protein hydrolysate and, and dextrose uh, solution that's being provided there. Um, in this paper, he also developed some concepts of this portable infusion system. Um, you could see the battery packs and the pumps in itself and, and just kind of marvel at how far we have come, especially when it comes to the catheter technique. Uh, but really soon after this was described, we started to see other descriptions and development of major centers across the U.S., North America, even Canada, University of Toronto, um, starting to develop their home parental nutrition program, starting to train uh, patients on providing parental nutrition. Some of the early lessons, you know, that they described were the use of sterile products, right? Minimizing infections, minimizing those complications, making sure that the entire process was easy for uh, the patients to do at home, starting to look at, you know, what are some of the complications, including hypoglycemia and how to manage those. So fascinating work and a lot of great publications. Uh, but what we started to see was the growth really from you know the late 60s, early 70s, to to the 80s, uh, into the 90s, really the growth of uh, parental nutrition at home. And when Dr. Lynn Howard can, uh, you know, published her pivotal work uh, in the 90s, she estimated about 40,000 Americans on parental nutrition at home, uh, 157 uh, per million Americans. And you started to see that the indications also started to change a lot more, you know, cancer and other indications starting to emerge. Um, but what we then started to see was that, you know, the, the management of parental nutrition by major centers started to decline over the next few decades. And more and more our DME providers, infusion companies, stepped up and started to manage more and more of the, the parental nutrition component. So you've seen some of this work. One, the prevalence declined, and I think multiple variables, you know, affecting this, including better management of Crohn's disease uh, as, as, and, and other diseases, so there's less need for parental nutrition at home. Um, but what we also saw was, again, this big shift to the DME providers managing the parental nutrition, less so at particular centers. And the way we saw this reflected, at least in the data from this study, was who was actually signing uh, the orders for uh, parental nutrition. You know, in the situation where you have major centers, you know, some of those providers are going to be signing parental nutrition for multiple patients on uh, parental nutrition, such as 10, uh, 20, maybe even more. Uh, but, you know, when you have situations where uh, the infusion companies are managing, 
often it falls on the primary care provider to sign the parental nutrition orders and that's what we're seeing here that in our data roughly uh, 6,703 providers signed the parental nutrition orders for 6,778 beneficiaries, almost a one-to-one -one ratio. And so that's, that's a big change as well that occurred over the next uh, few years. So um, thank you for bearing with me. I think those changes are important because more and more of this is, is something that you know you as consumers need to be quite aware of. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of shift to what are some of the big components of that HPN um, training? What goes into getting a patient ready uh, for parental nutrition at home? Um, and really, we know parental nutrition is quite expensive. Um, and so one of the big components is obtaining coverage. Um, again, when we looked at our 2013 data, about 27% of patients were covered by Medicare, 13% by Medicaid, uh, and then really about 60% by commercial and other um, insurance uh, coverages. Uh, there's been a big shift in Medicare uh, coverage for home parental nutrition, uh, but still requiring this test of permanence, right, that there has to be this permanent impairment of the GI tract um, so that parental nutrition is needed uh, for a long or indefinite period. You have to de uh, document that, um, you know, or the coverage is often uh, not there as well, right? So once we obtain coverage, we start to have this discussion with the patient and start to take into account the why they need, you know, parental nutrition and really how long they will need it. All of these come into play as we're trying to decide um, which sort of catheter we are going to place uh, and how all of that is going to be managed, including who's going to be managing the catheter, who's going to be helping with the parental nutrition at home, really. And, and when we talk about catheters, what we're nowadays talking about are either tunneled catheters, ports, as you can see in the middle there, or pick lines. You know, pick lines tend to be more commonly used in the hospital setting. Um, our hospital has a um, nursing team that can go bedside and, and place a pick line, uh, so much more easier to place. Um, port, tunneled catheter, you know, the tunneled catheters are often placed by our interventional radiology, so patient has to go down to the radiology suite. They're tunneled some more, sedation is necessary, et cetera, right? Um, so we have to take all of those into account. But as I mentioned, really the key factors are, one, the duration. Um, at least with our program, you know, we've seen, and I'll talk about infections a little bit later, but really with our experience, uh, the Hickman catheters um, compared to the PICC lines have less uh, infection associated with them. And so our program uh, tends to use more Hickman catheters if we're thinking long term. Really, somewhere in the four, six, eight week range, you know, it, it, there's a gray zone, but um, with longer term use, we tend to favor the tunneled catheter, right? The other benefit of that tunneled catheter is that it's, it's present in the chest, so both arms are free for the patient to use um, to be able to connect and disconnect and really manage a lot of the care themselves. You know, our nurses are incredible about going to see the patient beforehand, making sure that our in interventional radiologist placed the initial tip in a location uh, where it can be seen by the patient if they if they look down and, and look to make sure that there's no infection or other issues that are arising, right? Uh, other factors that are, are we're big on uh, include using the least amount of lumens, right? We often prefer a single lumen Hickman catheter. Um, the more lumens you have, the more, um, you know, sites you have for 
bacteria to get in and, and cause infection. So the least amount of uh, lumens that we can get away with, even though this picture shows two lumens here, single lumen tunnel catheter is our, our preferred modality. Um, the other factor that we often consider is, again, the patient preference. You know, uh, this is really pertaining to the port versus the Hickman catheter. Some of our patients, you know, they, they really are hesitant uh, because of cosmetic reason or perhaps um, they like to go swimming. So um, in those situations, they want to be able to provide parental nutrition and de-access uh, the port. Again, if we're accessing and de-accessing on a daily basis, um, you know, there's, there's risk there, especially of skin breakdown. But, uh, you know, if it more infrequent access, de-access, um, you know, uh, some patients just prefer that, right? And then the final consideration, again, is that who's going to be able to take care of the catheter? Most uh, insurance, especially Medicare, will not cover home health uh, unless you have other reasons or maybe have PIC site care that needs to be done, et cetera. Uh, so we also have to take that into consideration. Uh, again, uh, some of the highlights of then, you know, we've got the catheter in place. We, we train patients on how to care for the catheter. But really, a lot of the training is focused on what are the complications that may arise um, with the use of this catheter, and how do we prevent those? Um, how do we flush? How do we lock, et cetera? Uh, right? How do we use the infusion pump? How do we provide vitamins, insulin, disconnect, connect, and, and make sure we can do all of this uh, safely, right? Then we follow patients because no matter how good the training is, no matter how well our patients do at home, complications are going to arise. I mean, this is, you have a central line with the tip that's close to the heart. Um, you know, complications are going to arise and they, they can become serious very quickly. So we often check in with the patient soon after they're at home, make sure they're doing well, then a few weeks later, and then really monthly if they're doing well. Uh, same thing with labs. Initially, we check weekly, then we start to shift to biweekly, and then really monthly if they're, again, doing well, and we're not making too many changes. Uh, and then we tend to see patients on an annual basis at a minimum, but we can see more frequently if needed, right? And in this situation, I'll really just focus on um, the last half of my talk on, on the catheter-related complications. Um, and one of the main ones are, are clots that can occur, right? And these are referred to as central uh, catheter-related uh, venous thrombosis. Um, and so this is any thrombosis that occurs adjacent to that central venous catheter. Um, when we look at the literature, really reporting about a rate of 0 0.02 to 0 0.2 per thousand catheter days. So this is a good way to look at it, you know, um, and compare across studies as per catheter days. Um, and the risk factors are there. You know, um, we have endothelial damage, right? What that means is the inner lining of the vein gets damaged anytime um, you're putting a catheter through there, um, right? So the key is, again, not to do too much damage, but this can activate the clotting cascade, et cetera. Patients may also be hypercoagulable to begin with, right? Malignancy can be a hypercoagulable state. Uh, so they also ha are at risk from the reason they're on parental nutrition sometimes. The other risk factor is that there's a restriction of blood flow in the vessel, right? Veins tend to be low pressure state compared to arteries, right? So anytime you have blood flow growing through that vein, uh, it's not at a high pressure state. So if you have this long catheter that's running, um, you can have more of blood flow slowing down and perhaps, you know, developing um, a thrombosis there. Uh, the other big thing to keep in mind uh, is tip location. And this is something we really emphasize to patients and we're, we try our best to make sure at a minimum on an annual basis 
we're checking the tip locations for our patients. Uh, I think this study just sort of highlights this so well. Um, you know, more than 428 patients had central venous, I'm sorry, 428 catheters, central venous catheters placed in 334 patients. Um, and then what they did was they looked back and said, um, you know, what was the incidence of thrombosis and how did that relate to the tip location? Um, again, the key for us always is to have the tip of our catheter um, as close to the heart as possible. So we call this location the low SVC or the SVC RA junction. That's ideal location for this. So not only, you know, is it uh, from a standpoint of uh, the catheter placement, did it move, et cetera, but the TPN that we're providing um, is also very thick. And we use osmoles to kind of define that thickness. So anytime you start to get into TPN formulas that are higher than eight, nine hundred thousand osmoles, you know, you again run that risk of um, disrupting the blood flow, right? Just imagine you putting syrup into um, uh, into kind of the blood uh, supply there. Um, you know, blood may start to back up a little bit or not flow as well. And again, that can place a risk. So you want to make sure that that tip where that, that infusion of the parental nutrition is occurring is as close to the heart as possible or in a big vein as possible. And that's what they showed here. You can see that those proximal locate, meaning, you know, away from the heart, they had much, much higher risk of thrombosis than those closer uh, to the heart, um, right? So that's something to keep in mind as well, right? The next complication that we run into is catheter infection. Um, again, uh, this, is, this is our data, but other groups have also shown very similar data. Um, despite best efforts by our patients, these, these catheter infections occur, and we have to know how to appropriately manage them. So this is us doing a retrospective review of our patient population over almost 13 year time frame. Uh, this is the number of patients we had, um, their age, their indications, and the type of catheters used. You can see most of the time, 80% of the time, we're using single lumen Hickman catheters. But again, this will depend on the center. Um, right over that time, what we saw was 465 infections and we call these central line associated bloodstream infections in 187 patients, uh, right? Again, a rate of about 0 0.64 episodes per thousand catheter days, right? Other groups have shown very similar data, 0.3 to 0.6. Um, here's the bacteria that were um, the cause of those infections. This is what we were able to get out of the cultures. But the key concept here is this concept of catheter salvage. You know, infection is going to occur. We want to make sure we know how to manage it appropriately. And if we're able to, we want to make sure that we're able to salvage that catheter, meaning we don't want to just have it be removed right away. We want to try, if a patient is hemodynamically stable, not septic, to be able to salvage or treat through that. So I'll show you that here as to our approach. You know, patient calls in and, and says that they're febrile. Often we have them go to their local emergency department so they can assess if they're stable. Blood pressure is okay. Um, you know, clinically they're doing okay. Uh, if they are, um, at that point we try and obtain blood cultures. We look for metastatic infection, meaning you know, are, are we dealing with uh, valve infection? Is it, uh, you know, some other tissue that's that's infected? Uh, if all of those are no, uh, we try and obtain blood cultures. We have them start empiric antibiotic therapy. Again, try to be broad spectrum as I've outlined there. Um, you know, and try and give that first dose in the emergency room, especially if they've never gotten that particular antibiotic before want to make sure there's no allergic reactions. Then we try to continue this at home if they're discharged from the ER. Uh, oftentimes, patients will get admitted 
um, and they can be monitored in the hospital. When those cultures come back, um, you know, that allows us to tailor the antibiotics. We can reduce, um, you know, uh, the spectrum of the antibiotics and pick the ones that that bacteria is sensitive to and then complete treatment. Um, once the treatment is completed, um, we can then recheck cultures, make sure there's they're afebrile, uh, and, and kind of, um, you know, continue um, uh, with the normal parental nutrition regimen. You know, oftentimes patients are admitted to the hospital. Um, in that case, we can often hold parental nutrition until we get cultures back, patient is stable, and then we can start to treat. Uh, and then usually in 48 hours of treatment, we see that the cultures start to become negative, and then we can restart uh, parental nutrition uh, in that situation. Um, so those are kind of the keys to management. Again, if we can, we want to make sure that patients don't go to the ER with that line being removed, um, you know, right away, especially when we're dealing with a tunneled catheter or uh, dealing with a, a port especially. Um, oftentimes we see these removals with pick lines and have the pick lines placed on the other side. Uh, but again, complication there is, you know, eventually you do run out of access uh, with all of the endothelial damage and other damage that's occurring. Um, so then the other aspect of line infections is really trying to look at prevention. There's primary prevention, meaning someone who started on uh, parental nutrition but has never had an infection. What should we do in that situation to try to prevent uh, an infection from occurring? And then there's secondary prevention, meaning those who've already had an infection, maybe multiple, what do we do in those situations? Um, you know, I'll share with you the ethanol lock data. That's what's been available um, in the U.S. as well as antibiotic locks. Um, but in, in um, Europe and, and elsewhere, you know, we also have uh, tarolidine locks as well. This is a derivative of amino acid. Um, uh, taurine that prevents microbial adhesion to catheter sur uh, surfaces and biofilm um, formation. Um, so this is, uh, you know, readily available, and I'm really hoping that with the cost of ethanol locks going up as they have, that we're able to get a product like this available in uh, the U.S. Um, this is a meta-analysis, again, included multiple randomized controlled trials, over 86,000 catheter days, comparing different heparin lock versus uh, tarolidine locks, and you can see that it dramatically reduces the incidence of uh, line infection with its use. Here's another article. Again, this is in patients on hemodialysis, TPN oncology, showing very similar results dramatic reduction in, in infection, right? So hoping that this uh, becomes available in the U.S. Uh, soon. Um, you know, in the meantime, we had been using ethanol locks quite a bit, and we were especially using ethanol lock for secondary prevention in those, you know, who previously had um, an infection or multiple infections. Um, we then decided to do a randomized trial uh, where we use ethanol locks um, empirically in, in all patients and compare those to heparin locks. Um, you know, as we were doing st the study, we had enrolled 18 patients in the ethanol lock group, 20 in the heparin lock group. You could see the indications there, um, right? We were, we were kind of marching along. Um, the guidelines uh, from ESPIN on intestinal failure were published, and they strongly recommended against using 70% ethanol to prevent, um, you know, central line associated infections um, because of uh, their associated systemic toxicity, risk of catheter occlusion, and damage. Um, you know, they also recommended. Uh, instead, providing re-education using some of the other catheter locks, such as antibiotic lock, antimicrobial locks, or the tolerodine, um 
locks uh, instead. So when we read this, we said, oh, oh, we better analyze some of our data uh, as to what we're finding. And in that interim analysis, now this is always a risk, right? Because, you know, is the study powered enough to be able to detect this difference? But we started to see that there was really no difference in the rate of infection between ethanol lock and the heparin locks. Uh, so with this, we said at least for primary infection, it doesn't look like ethanol locks are going to be helpful. Again, this is an interim analysis. We need bigger data. So we've instead shifted focus on using ethanol locks more so for that those individuals who've already had an infection. Um, again, the big issue right now is the cost of these has increased significantly. So we're really using it in patients who have multiple infections. Um, okay, last um, topic I'll kind of talk about is catheter uh, damage. Um, you know, this can also occur again over time. Um, and this is just a perfect example of that. Uh, one of our HPN patients' husband reported uh, that uh, they had some increased resistance when they were trying to flush. Uh, you know, he flushed a little as hard as he could and um, the catheter sprung a leak. Um, in this situation, you know, we asked the patient to clamp the line and uh, uh, come in if they're able to. Uh, we have been using these repair kits and have shown the protocol uh, for how to repair um, the catheter you know, and, and cleaning. Um, here we're describing it uh, being cut uh, and then inserting um, the repair kit uh, along with this um, uh, sheath that kind of goes over that location where it's repaired. Uh, and then you can see us uh, inserting that uh, adhesion and then finally uh, finishing the repair by securing it and allowing it to, to sit in place for a, uh, with a splint. But what we were worried about is, you know, is the repair the way to go, um, you know, or should we be replacing this catheter? Again, uh, the big worry here is, um, you know, with repeated catheter replacements, you start to lose access. You know, you start to lose access in the upper body, then you're really limited with lower body access, or in this case, a translumbar Hickman catheter, as you can see which is in the back of a patient. Again, you know, much harder for the patient to visualize the, the tip, get to it, right? Some more help needed. Um, but this access is the lifeline for our patients. And so when I talk about infections, when I talk about damage, um, you know, thrombosis, we have to do our best to really um, minimize the complication, I'm sorry, minimize the complications as well as removal of these catheters as much as we can. Um, and we looked at the difference in repair. You know, were those repaired catheters leading to increased risk of infection? Um, and we had 55 catheter repairs uh, that we had done, and we looked at before and after rates, and you could see 0.23 per thousand catheter days um, before, and then 0.21 per 1,000 catheter days afterwards. So really no difference uh, in increase in infection rate. What we also saw was that the catheter duration almost doubled, right? Before the repair, on average, and I think this may be the median, uh, we were looking at 895 days of use before. With the repair, we extended it another 685 days. So you can imagine what a big impact that is, almost doubling uh, the duration uh, of its use without it getting repaired. Uh, that buys patient more time, and again, uh, hopefully they don't need uh, something like this in the future. So uh, with that, I close and uh, again look forward to your uh, questions. Uh, thank you so much for your attention.